beautiful. Mm-hmm. Legendary jazz and fusion drummer Billy Cobham has been blazing trails since his work with Miles Davis and the Mahavishnu Orchestra. He will be performing at the Kumba Jazz Center Thursday, March 15th, featuring his work from the Crosswinds album. Billy, welcome to the Test of Time. Thank you, Carol. It's a pleasure to be here. So you're on tour uh, with the Crosswinds Project, revisiting uh, this album recorded in 1974. Uh, you toured in 2013 for the 40th anniversary of your debut solo album, Spectrum. Some may think this is just a natural progression to move on to your sophomore album, but revisiting this album is much more personal for you. Well, it has a lot of uh, history behind it now, and uh, it I can identify with it much, much better. I mean, it's been at least around 40 years since, since we did this thing, mm-hmm. and Everything, a lot of things have happened along the way, and uh, further drives home the idea that in music, um, as a parallel point of uh, uh, or concept of, of expression, uh, there's so much uh, in, in the treasure chest, for lack of a better term, to draw from. And uh, some of the pieces that I wrote, I. <laughs> I uh, I can't even understand. I would never have written it uh, except to to show somehow a reflection of where I came from. Uh, cause music is a is a big history history book of of, of the mind. And uh, let's just, let's take us uh, Spanish moss for instance. Uh, it's a very special piece, but it was fundamentally a piece that I wanted to reflect upon where I came from. Just at the time most recently, which was from the Mahavishnu Orchestra. So I wrote this thing in 17, uh, 178, whatever. And uh, it was with that idea in mind. Uh, after that, there was there was a melody and there was some rhythmic pattern, but there wasn't anything else. And the reason be- behind that was because I didn't know what else to write. So we recorded that, and we did that. And I just promptly put it away for most of the 40 years that uh, I haven't played it uh-huh. until now. And when when I look back on where I was and, and to where it is now and understand that I've had a lot of practice and experiences that, come, that have come through those, those these times from 1974 to, to 2018, so that's 44 years, good grief. Um, there's a lot to draw from, and, and I think that... Uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why I, I look. I, I, I picked that piece because it, t- it tends to tell tell the story of of the fact that and drive home the point that music is uh, is a language that uh, is multi dimensional and depth and and all perspectives and and uh, it probably trumps spoken word many times over. Mm. Well, did you feel like the Crosswinds uh, album seemed incomplete until now? Um, it didn't seem incomplete. It just seemed as if uh, I didn't know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I only played, I only played some pieces, and I didn't understand what what to do with it or what I had written. It, the groove, okay, that was easy. Crosswinds, great groove. Heather, lots of history. You know uh, where it came from, why I wrote it. Uh, Pleasant Pheasant was another groove piece that now has changed into something completely, not completely different, but as, as much as, as the Spanish moss. But yeah, it, it's grown. Um, and then you have, uh, let's see, it's, it's, it's Crosswinds, Heather, Pleasant Pheasant, uh, Spanish moss. There were five pieces, actually. Um, we're going to be doing, um, let's, uh, Savannah's a serene, but it, 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 that hasn't really taken hold the way I would like it to yet. So we've got other pieces that re- represent that general genre in a piece called um, uh, uh, around the ba- uh, Hands Around the Baobab Tree, which is a, a Baobab tree. is a, It's a huge tree that's normally the community tree and uh, where it was first found, I think, in Africa. And uh, it's where most decisions are made in the community. And... Uh, it made a big impression on me, even though I, I finally personally came in contact my, with my first Baba tree in Recife, Brazil. Hmm. Um, 
it, it was, uh, again, because of the Malayan uh, who came there, the people from Mali and, and all who brought there, and the Nigerians, all of the slaves, the people who came over to work in, in Brazil, mm-hmm. uh, in northern Brazil, and they brought their seeds. And there were about 85 registered uh Baobab trees in the nor- in northern Brazil, to my no- Brazil, to my knowledge, they all have each actually a number. Um, hmm. Really a beautiful tree. It's, a, it's a something that its roots just just continue to grow throughout the country, uh, and you can always see them on a hill standing by themselves. But they 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 do take up a lot of room mm-hmm. and they can command a lot of attention. So uh, yeah, it's. Uh, from that, it, 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 it's the same as in Savannah the Serene, which was, uh, oh, and I forgot about it. Yeah, I, th- I did mention Heather. Um, it's, it's just uh, Heather and Savannah the Serene are very close. They rep- uh, Heather represents my, my experience sitting literally under the atomic dome in Hiroshima and coming up with this idea, uh, this, this theme, uh, which opened up into a lot of different things and reflects back on on the first solo played uh, by a saxophonist, and that was Michael Brecker, mm-hmm. and uh, and of course a piano solo with George Duke, and the guitar support with John Abercrombie. All three have now passed on to the great beyond. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of things to come into the Heather recording that uh, are kind of side stories, if you will, for and uh, you know it ties into a lot of life as it is, as it was then, as it is now. So, uh, yeah, we got something. Mm-hmm. Well, and Spanish Moss, is that uh, um, inspired from your time on the Big Sur Coast in the Monterey Bay area? Oh, yeah, and again, yeah, it has a lot to do with me in photography, being able to to see the trees, uh, being on the Route 1, especially at a, a time or south of Monterey around Carmel with the in the, in the fall when it's the rainy season, mm-hmm. lots of uh, uh, mudslides, things like this. The most one of the most, I mean, with, with danger, there's always beauty, and um, <laughs> it's beyond belief. I mean, the United States on the, on the West Coast can how it can be, and uh, but it can also be very, very uh, precarious. Uh, you just never know what you're going to get. Right. You have to be careful. Right. And uh, so. Uh, that again is inspiring in its own way, and hence Spanish moss. And is that you shot the cover? Is the cover of Crosswinds yes, I from did. Uh, mm-hmm. the Carmel area? Is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, I, did. I thought that looked yeah. familiar. Yeah, yes, almost sir. like near Carmel Beach, I think. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the cypress trees a whole bit. I did a lot of re- uh, fish eye shots there, but I didn't. I, I, ch- I chose not to take one. And what I did was I took that shot with a 21 millimeter wide angle and then I turned it upside down and made it took two shots and made them into one. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Well, and this isn't the first time that you've revisited um the title cut of Crosswinds uh was you visited that uh on the Fruit of the Loom series. Um, yeah. w- was that considered you consider that your the beginning of your retro musical explorations to connect you to your past for a a more no. clear future, or no? I, I I consider the first album. Uh, when you listen to Red Baron, you'll hear another, a, a different arrangement right. of, of of that. Not not Stratus, but Red Baron has its own has a no a new kind of face, an older face. It's been played a lot now that arrangement, and and it's kind of become it's taken taken its own, taken on its own life, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people play that. There's even a newer one that I didn't write, and, and I'm, I'm quite honored. It's by a guy that lives uh, in Tennessee, in Nashville, and it's, it's a completely different group, yet it is Red Baron. Mm. And uh, I, I hope to start to play that, too, cause just to show the difference. Cause it, it, it's so funny, and, 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 and it makes you want to stand up and, and just move. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's nice. To, it, it's a big salute when people cover your tune and, and uh, make it, uh, take on a different personality, it's, uh, or a personality that's parallel to what you already have. Right. It's you know I I I, I am quite honored when that happens. Mm-hmm. Now that's what I look for in a cover is is the same tune but their interpretation of it. It's um, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. I I am with you. There. I'm with you there. It's like the same with uh, with Massive Attack. You know with Stratus. Oh sure. But that, 
you know, and, and that's another one. But that, that hasn't taken hold the way that these other ones have as, as instrumental. So. Right. Well, I was looking at your tour schedule to see if you were heading down south, if um, you were going to be able to uh, go through Big Sur, but it looks like you're heading straight over to Honolulu tomorrow for several shows. Well, well, we'll head to, we'll be as close to you as Santa Cruz. Right, so... Kumbwa. Y- right, you're in the area. You're in the on field the 14th, of... the Right, yeah. yeah. And so that would be where you'd catch us. And then the, on the 15th, which will be an experience for me, we're flying in the morning to Honolulu oh. to play that night, and I'm going, come on, you're joking. <laughs> but yeah, we lose, we, we gain two hours, right. and, and, and so it's cool. We'll get it done. Right. So when you're listening to your own music, do you hear um, your past recordings, do you hear your age and experience on the recording when you listen to it? Not, not, uh, I, not, I'm not focused on it now that you brought it up. Now I will focus on it because I just never did, naturally. Mm-hmm. No. I just, I mean, the stuff I, I listened to, and I remember when I used to go, I used to believe in, in, in certain things that Miles would say and do. And one of them was, I played that already. So he mm-hmm. wouldn't play anymore. Mm-hmm. And that, that can take you down the wrong route. Uh, and, and eventually we have to come back around. Mm-hmm. And I just decided to, to just start to explore. The reason why I actually started to come back to my old stuff is because I felt that I didn't, I didn't consciously take care of it in recordings or play it properly because I lacked the, the knowledge of how to do it. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, I felt that I could play it better once I learned more about who I was inside myself. And, and came out with some other experiences. So I felt that the, the, the music that I wrote left me, left an open door. It was almost like it was a pa- parameter or a, or a square box with nothing in it, mm-hmm. in, a, in a, a building that with nothing in it except floors. And now I had to fill them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that only would come with time, because I, I didn't know how. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what's nice about music is that mm-hmm. you can, as a as a creative medium, is that you can. Um, you, it's easy to go back and revisit, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, Van Gogh. You know, didn't paint another Starry Night, um, or as an as a uh, an artist who a, a visual artist. Um, you know, you may paint a series, but um, you know, it's not an easy medium to go back and go. Oh, you know. I'm going to touch this up, or I'm going to redo this yeah. particular painting. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's the uh, that's the blessing about about the field that you're in is that it allows you to continually be creative, um, mm-hmm. even on um, your older pieces. So yeah, I hear you. Yeah, so that's why I do it. Yeah. So um, if our listeners are just uh, tuning in, I'm speaking with jazz drummer Billy Cobham, and you're listening to The Test of Time on KZSC Santa Cruz. Um, Billy will be um, performing at the Coomba Jazz Center coming up this Thursday, March 15th. Tell us a little bit about the band that's on tour with you. You have three members um, that are have been with you teaching at the Art and Rhythm Retreat Workshop. Yeah, but before we do that, double check that about that March March fifteenth. I'm not too sure if we're there the uh, March fourteenth. Uh, oh, you're 15th, right. I think, you're there on yeah. Thursday. What's today? Uh, to, we're here in Seattle, and it's to, today is the eighth. The eighth so is Thursday, go, so you're there on you're there uh, next Thursday, which would be the fifteenth. It you're, is the fifteenth. Yeah, so we're playing a week from today. Fifteenth, yeah, sorry? a week from okay, today, so seven. Yeah. Okay. Good. All righty. Two shows. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought it was three. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> yeah, just checking. Just yeah. checking. Okay, yeah. so tell us um, about your band. The Art of the Rhythm, sec- yeah, the Art of the Rhythm Section Retreat. Uh, we'll have uh, Scott Tibbs on keyboards, and Scott's down at UCLA, mm-hmm. but he also works with Roland officially as their, one of their uh, the keyboard representatives. And, uh, and then we have... Uh, 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 Farid Haq, who is, uh, was, is, I still currently, uh, at Northern Illinois University and has a guitar chair, uh, the jazz guitar chair at Northern Illinois University, and used to work with Joe Zabinu. And uh, after that, we have Paul Hansen, who used to work with Bella Fleck. Mm-hmm. 
mm. and also is teaching in the San Francisco area. Uh, but it, and what's so unique about Paul is that he's a woodwind player who specializes in playing jazz bassoon. Hmm. So that'll be that'll be a very interesting thing to, for you guys to check out. Wow! He also plays wonderful soprano saxophone and tenor sax. Uh, as he as he did, he played with Cirque, uh, Cirque du Soleil for quite a few years in Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, he went missing on me. I couldn't find him, and it turned out that's where he was. And in the end, the last, it, the last but definitely not least, is Tim Landers. He used to be in my band. We first met with Gil Evans in, in the Gil Evans Orchestra back in 1981 um, at uh, Joe Paff's uh, Public Theater. Um, in New York City, and then from there, we st- he started to work with me with um, a band I had called Glass Menagerie, mm-hmm. uh, and which fe- Michael was it Michael Lubaniak and and Gil Gil Goldstein and uh, Tim Lander, uh, t- um, Dean Brown, people like that. oh it's John uh, Mike Stern was there before, and that's actually the band that Miles then got Mike Stern out of, and uh, Dean Brown took his place. Mm. So. Yeah, that's the band, and uh, Tim is teaching at the Los Angeles College of Music. Hmm. What's well, going to be really interesting uh, is he's going to pull out his bassoon for us. Oh, he's, he's <laughs> most most of the material is on bassoon. Okay. Uh, wow. There's about two or three tunes, and he plays electric bassoon. It's a, it's all connected. It's, it's a fascinating situation. It's really wonderful. Well, that's going to be interesting to see and mm-hmm. hear. Mm-hmm. Um, going mm-hmm. back again, I have um, an older question for you. Um, as a teenager, you were in a drum corps and then later in the U.S. Army Band. Uh, how did these experiences shape your style of drumming that has crossed over into so many different genres? Oh, it, uh, I think it's a question that you should ask some of the local drum corps around, around your area, like the Santa Clara Vanguard or the, uh, the Concord Blue Devils, which I've had some association with. Hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, a discipline mm-hmm. is, is the word that comes up. Uh, it's not just about playing uh, correctly, but consistently in a way that presents your personality. And uh, musically, that's that's something that is uh, a fleeting kind of uh, uh, element uh, or dimension within within artists, uh, unfortunately, and but fortunately for me, so I, it, it, the, the military has helped me a lot in terms of creating that and, and helping me to define that area of my performance, uh, so I can do what I want to do when I want to do it, um, and understand how I want to treat it. I, I just don't do it by happenstance, and that's very important. Mm-hmm. Well, and your first solo album, Spectrum, was critically acclaimed, but you didn't let that define your career. Was it frustrating for you to have such success so early in your career where for a number of follow- the following years your albums were often compared or measured against this piece of work? No, uh, because I didn't even know what I had when I had it. Hmm. Uh, I, I didn't know that I had a hit record for six months. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kept recording with people, and so uh, I, I, when people would, uh, on, the, on the recording session would say to me, "Hey, you know, man, that's a good record you got," I go, "Oh, you mean the uh, the?" I stop and think about what record. Uh, <laughs> then I go, "Oh, you mean the Cunny Burrell, uh, or <laughs> you mean the Stanley Turnkey?" Oh, oh no, you, oh White Rabbit on you? No, and everybody keeps saying no. <laughs> And I kept going, what are you talking about? And he said, your record. I said, my record? Then I realized, oh, yeah, I made a record about what, six months ago. Said, man, don't you ever look at billboards? <laughs> no, man. I, I got to put food on the table for myself and my family. Why am I going to buy a magazine like that for? <laughs> and I said, it's in billboards. I said, really? What's it in billboards for? I said, it's number, number 30 with a bullet or something. I said, get out of here. Okay, where can I borrow one? Or what, you know. Right. I wasn't even thinking about it. Right. And, uh, and one thing led to another, and you know that's all part of the the whole scene. With I guess just doing this, I'm, one thing leads to another. You end up with lots of people going, "Yeah, you should do this. You should do that." Hi, that's a nice record you got. Why don't you write a book? And I go, oh, "Nobody ever watch it or, or read any book of mine." And would you believe? Sure enough, man, I got a book coming out. <laughs> <laughs> cool. It's called Yeah, it's called Six Days of Ronnie Scott. It, uh, uh, we just 
a friend of mine named Brian Gruber, who's a, a writer, sat down with me all for about a week at Ronnie Scott's in London, and we went through a whole bunch of stuff, and then he started to fill in the gaps with interviews with Randy Brecker and Bill Bruford mm-hmm. and all of the people that I, I work with, uh, uh, Ron Carter, uh, Jan Hammer. It's a lot of people in there, but just about what, what they thought about what I was doing and mm-hmm. blah, 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 and then the, the stories that we shared. and It's kind of nice. It'll be out soon. Good. So you might want to oh. keep, a, keep a lookout yeah. for that one, too. Yeah, I'll keep a lookout for that. Mm-hmm. So, and your projects include work with um, your past projects, a, a Nordic acoustic quartet, a, a German-based yeah. fusion band, yeah. Cuban yeah. group, funk musicians, mm-hmm. big band orchestras, and, of course, um, mm-hmm. your rock-infused jazz of your early mm-hmm. career. What what other musical genres pique your interest for a future project? Well, we're going to re- continue to, to do the orchestral stuff. I've, I've worked with the, the National Symphony of Russia in Moscow just this past uh, Christmas, uh, and uh, along with, uh, uh, I don't know if you know uh, Grace Kelly, the, the alto saxophonist? No. You ever hear of her? No. Okay. I'll write her Check name her down. Out. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a very famous name. But she studied with uh, she studied with Phil Woods, and mm-hmm. she's an amazing alto saxophonist. And we work with uh, uh, director Svivakov in, in the house of uh, the house of music in Moscow at Christmas, uh, playing music uh, dedicated to for Christmas time. Some of it was from from Pops, from uh, uh, Louis Armstrong, St. Louis Blues, things like this, with full orchestra, and it was a lot of fun to do. And so I'm I'm kind of going in that direction. Uh, orchestrally, I've worked with the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra, where we work. I produced a project called uh, 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 Inner Mountain Flame, or no, what was it? It wasn't Inner Mountain Flame. It was uh, uh, it was the music of the of the Mahavishnu Orchestra, but it, it was just for me mm-hmm. uh, to attest. With a hundred, well, we had a hundred pieces on the bandstand. Most of them, sixty of them, were string players, and they played the guitar parts of John McLaughlin. Um, but it was full orchestra. Other than that. Um, and, uh, that was, that was a lot of fun to do with Colin, um, I can't even remember Colin's last name now, but, uh, the, the, his, he was a writer, a ranger and the, uh, the conductor of that band, mm. of that project. Mm. And, um, so I'm kind of doing things more uh, with orchestra, uh, working again, as you mentioned with the, how can I say the, in the marching band area. Looking at projects with Her Majesty's Household Regimental Bands uh, uh, in London, where they have a big jazz band, and uh, so it's nice to do my music with them, and uh, things like this will be coming down the pipe. Mm-hmm. Well, you're always up to something, I see. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, man, we got to eat, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, and during my preparation for our interview, I, I discovered not only that you're an accomplished photographer, but that you're doing this incredible artwork uh, made from rhythm using long exposure photography and lighted drumsticks. Oh, yeah. That yeah. that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Oh, great! It's incredible. Yeah. So, how did how did that come about? Somebody came to me and said, "Do you want to do this?" He <laughs> <I> said, "Okay." <laughs> So take a shot at it. Wow. And so where were we? We were at NAMM. Uh-huh. And this guy, Corey, came over to me and said, hey, I got this thing. And he showed me a little bit of it and said, yeah, I think uh, Weckl had done it. Maybe Gad had done something else. Uh, Kyle Uta. said, you want to take a shot at it? I said, sure. He said, okay, well, you know, we, we shoot at night on the soundstage over in the, in the valley. So mm-hmm. we drove all the way up there and did it, you know. Yeah. And uh, the rest is history. We... I did about 20 images, and, and so far they've done pretty good. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, if people yeah. are interested in seeing that, they can they can find your artwork at billycobhamart.com. Mm-hmm. They want to check that out. So, mm-hmm. Billy, uh, Cobham will be performing two shows at the Kumba Jazz Center this coming Thursday, um, March 15th. And for fans contemplating which show to purchase a ticket for, um, is there going to be a difference in the set list? By about one or two tunes, I guess. Okay, yeah, three tunes. Yeah, we have a we have an a, a, an actual art a portfolio of about eleven to to thirteen compositions that we do, and out of that comes uh, for about a 
90 minute show would be about nine compositions, mm-hmm. so anything is possible. Mm-hmm. You know? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, we're really looking forward to uh, your performance here at the Kumba Jazz Center. It's a, it's a lovely, small, intimate venue, and um, I'm, we're just so excited that you're coming. Um, it's been an honor talking with you, and I look forward to your show next week, um, March 15th okay. on Thursday. And um, safe travels until then. Thank you very much. Looking forward myself. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye, Billy.